All right, it's one o'clock. I'm here with my good friend, Dr. Harden. We will, let's just wait, you know, because we have a close to 650 people. Uh, and I'm not saying that to, to make you nervous. <laughs> <laughs> we have close to 650 people who are signed up today. And let's just give them, you know, maybe 30 seconds or so to come in. Right now we are at 250, 230. So people kind of join us and we'll get started. Okay. Hi, everybody. Everybody. Look at all these U City people already using the chat button. Ah. <laughs> Hi, Deidre. Takesha Park Palmer. All right, Sharonica, here we go. So welcome back to Wednesday, say something with my little sister <laughs> <laughs> and friend and colleague, Dr. Sharonica Harden Bartley. Um, I'm really excited about this presentation. I'm really excited about um, you, you know, what, what you're gonna share. Um, and I really wanna start with this, right? Obviously you guys know by now, every single week I let the presenter uh, introduce themselves because I think it's important for you to let the world know who you are and what you want to share about yourself. So Sharonica would do that in a second. Um, but I was thinking about, you know, the intro and what I was going to say um, about Sharonica, who is truly like one of my favorite people in education. And I think that um, the whole concept of say something is really somewhat tied to you know, our relationship and, and, you know, our partnership over the last X amount of years, right? And so, you know, the people who are part of this series are individuals who have truly been saying something and saying things and talking about this work for a while, right? And it's so important for us to continue these conversations. But then it's really important for us to validate and affirm those individuals who at times felt like they were probably out there by themselves, right? And I know how hard it is um, to say things and be seen as radical or you know, not having individuals you know, see or believe what you believe when you're truly fighting on behalf of all the kids. Um, and I'm also uh, mindful of this presentation and the title, Heavy is the Head. And so I just wanna say, as we celebrate Sharonica's 25th year in education. Um, we appreciate you. We see you. Uh, we validate you. We affirm your, your being. And I know the head is heavy, but you have an <laughs> army of people behind you who are supporting you. So let's say something with Dr. Harden. Thank you, um, Terry, my friend, my, my brother, my little brother, because I have a few years on you. Um, thank you for creating the space for us to have this conversation. Um, my conversation is your conversation. Um, we all um, carry this, this load of heaviness in the space that we're in. If you're in education and sometimes your head doesn't get a little heavy, um, then maybe you're not leading with your heart. So we're gonna just have a quick conversation about me and my journey, but really more importantly, I hope to empower you to continue to engage in the work. And um, I hope to inspire you to use your voice. I hope to inspire you to fundamentally understand how um, intimately we are all connected and how we are truly all in this together. And so as I begin my 25th year in public education, I think it's very fitting that I'm in this space. And we didn't plan this day, but um, Carrie, Terry picked the day and told me when I needed to be available and it just happens to be um, when I'm beginning that, that journey, but continuing that journey. So let me, let me quickly tell you who I am, um, just to set the stage. I'm a mother first. I have two beautiful children um, who really guide and, and represent my why in this space. I'm a wife. I have a very supportive husband. I would not be able to do the work without him. I am a Christian, so I do believe that God has a purpose for my life and that he is truly ordering my steps. I'm a leader, um, status quo disruptor, and there are other things that you see there. I think that one piece um, that is somewhat significant, I've spent the majority of my years 
over the last 25 in, in a leadership role and not just a teacher leader, but in a principal role, central office, and now um, moving into the superintendent for the amazing school district of University City. And I'm so honored to have the opportunity to serve in this role. And I'm entering my fifth year here. So that's enough about me. What I like to do, and we do this in U City, we build community. I think community building is the cornerstone of relationships. Um, I don't think that anything meaningful happens absent relationships. Rita Pearson said it best when we talk about learning. Um, children simply don't love, learn from people they don't love. And you really can't educate children if you don't care about them and don't authentically care about their well-being. So my check-in question, and you can just draft it in the chat. What have you done in the last 48 hours to support another human being? And let me give you a caveat, not someone in your immediate family. What have you done for someone? What have you done to support someone? And as you check in, my ask is that you just ground yourself in this space. Um, I don't have anything provocative to share. A lot of what I'm gonna share you already know, but I hope that I affirm you, I inspire you, and I help you to continue this journey because it really is about all of us working and tandem together. Do you wanna wait for a few responses? You want me to share? Are you one? getting any? I hope you're getting some. Yeah, can you share a couple? I mean, they're coming in so fast, but- uh, Okay, just give me a couple. A lot of listen to friends, called friends, uh, wore a face, face mask when I went shopping. <laughs> Um, listen to friends, checked in on friends, supported a facilitator, refilled our personal food pantry, supporting colleagues and friends during this time, sent thank you cards or thinking of you cards. Okay. All those donated to another black educator who is lo local to STL, yeah. prayed with the group for the lost in this world, Relay good news to students who won art competition. Great, awesome. Well, thank you, thank you for sharing. I think that um, as we talk about the, the head and the heart of work, if you're not supporting somebody, then you're certainly not leading with your heart. So I wanna give you some context about my journey. Um, and as I think about where we are with everything that's happening in our country around racism, police brutality, um, the injustices that we're seeing in so many areas and specifically how we are responding to COVID um, and the marginalized communities that that tragic disease is impacting at very large numbers. Um, this work for me began after the death of a young man, a young man who could have been my son, um, who could have been many of our, our sons. And the Forward Through Ferguson work, I think, gives a good blueprint of what was very wrong with our region, but also many of the things that we could do to improve it. So I joined the Child Education and Wellbeing and Equity Work Group for the Ferguson Commission and really began to have this conversation about not just the problem, but really trying to find solutions. So, my, my aim is to talk about what we're doing in response to these things and that it's unfortunate that it requires a tragedy such as George, George Floyd's death or the many others for us to take action. We have been living in this space in the St. Louis community since I've been in education and I grew up here. So I have been, I've experienced it my entire life. And so how do we take these incidents of tragedy that, that plague our community, that disrupt the fabric of our, of our structure and disrupt them. So I said this almost five years ago, given the opportunity to have a voice and be able to put some actionable things in place and not take the opportunity, then shame on me. It's my responsibility to be at the table and to have a voice. And that's all of our responsibility. That's why we do what we do. That's why we are educators. So the heaviest ahead comes from Shakespeare. It's very old, it's been around for a while. And it is a metaphor to describe a crown. I don't have a crown on my head, even though I know I am a queen, 
But the reality is I used it to describe the weight and the responsibility of being a leader, specifically of being an African-American female leader in a space that is predominantly male and predominantly white. It is a very heavy space. So I may wear a smile. Um, I can, you know, strut my stuff and be confident but I need the support of the community in order to be able to do the work that I do so that I can pave the way so that other young girls who look just like me can sit in this seat and be superintendent or whatever else they desire to be. As I move on, um, in every photo that you see in this deck are my amazing students, University City, is a rich community, uh, rich in diversity. We value equity, we value social justice, we value student voice. And so you'll see representations of the actionable things that we're doing in U City. And we are not where we need to be, but we are certainly on a journey and having conversations around the right things and also challenging assumptions around our children. So heaviness. As you think about that, in our current state of being as a region, as a nation, you as an educator in your current space, or whatever role that you play as you show up today, what is heavy for you? And just take a moment to jot those things down in the chat. What is heavy for you? I'm supposed to be reading these, right? And Zoom is my least favorite thing on the planet. So thank you for being patient with me. <laughs> I like to touch people. We can't touch right now. Uh, What's heavy? Leading equity work in my district. Uh, equity for all, all students. Uh, the pain of my neighbors, my friends. Fear that this movement will be co-opted. Black fatigue in the face of white fragility. Who said that? Come on with it. Yeah. Fighting racism within our community, community change, equity work in my district. When the children are not treated well. Good job, Erica Harris. <laughs> um, yeah. The lack of humanity in our society, yeah. helping others to see injustices being myself while also trying to grow. Yep. Seeing so many going back to status quo, fear for our children, yeah. trying to explain why we need co-conspirators over allies. Yeah. Uh, these are all good. Where to Thank start. You. Yeah. Thank you. you. Okay. And and you know your truth and and what may be heavy for me for me may not be the same for you. But the reality is no matter how you're showing up, whatever you look like your background. If you don't feel a little heavy right now, then, then something's wrong. So context matters. And I just wanted to set the, the context on the heaviness that, that we experience and specifically the heaviness that I experience as a, as a person of color and as a female leader of color. All of the isms um, that, we, that we see, that we know, that we live, that we experience, that we try to disrupt, those are real. They're not made up. Um, they did not start right now. This is not something that is new. Um, we've had a path for centuries. We, we've had a long history of these things where we have marginalized communities, specifically Black people in our country, and we have so many systems that intersect that completely stifle any type of progress and growth. And so the fact that our education system is forced to respond to many of these woes is just simply sad. But every aspect of what we consider to be the American dream, every aspect that we perceive to be, to give us prosperity and hope, every aspect that is intended to give us a quality of life has been disrupted, dysfunctional, non-existent for people of color and specifically for black people. So just take a moment and look at it. I'm not making it up, it's real. And it's been real for a very long time. We also know that St. Louis, our St. Louis, we are an innovator of segregation. We are among the 10 most segregated metropolitan areas in the US. 
and our schools are the same. That is a problem in the 20th century. Other examples, specifically right here in St. Louis, our context and why we're questioning why our young people are protesting and using their voice and are angry, they're tired. We have been here for a very, very long time. And I firmly believe that we know what we need to do to disrupt these systems. And we have people in positions now that can disrupt these systems, but they can't do it alone. So as a person of color, as a black female, um, I'm often told to dim my light. Um, don't be too, too proud. Don't, don't be too bold. Um, sometimes that can be intimidating. You're, you're, that was aggressive. You're so strong-willed. You're so passionate, emotional. I'm always to something, always to this or to that. And I have made the conscious decision. It's a conscious decision. And I'm very intentional about it. You can't silence me. I have a voice. I have my experiences. I have my heart. Sometimes I do wear it on my sleeve. Sometimes I cry. Sometimes I hurt. Sometimes I get a little angry. And if we're not just a little bit pissed about what's happening with our kids, again, we need to reevaluate. But I aim, I aim to show up as my best self. I aim to show up and represent excellence. I aim to exude it in everything that I do, even when I fall short because I understand fundamentally the honor and the privilege that I have been given, even though I am daily oppressed, daily as a person of color and as a female. But I understand that to whom much is given, much is required. And so I have to continue to stand and refuse to be silenced. So my why and the work that I do, and I want you to understand this is real for me. This is not about a job. I always say this, all of my board can do is fire me. I'm gonna do what's best for children and I'm gonna treat people with dignity and humanity and with kindness and with love because they need that, I need that. When I interviewed for the superintendency in the school district of University City on January of 2016, I had to present a re-entry plan or a program or an effort that I aim to implement if I were chosen as superintendent. This is what I said, my why, to create structures and the space for leaders and teachers to develop skills, competencies, grit, and courage that will improve student achievement and close the opportunity gaps linked to poverty and race. I have been on this journey my entire career. Opportunity is bold because I had achievement gaps. I fundamentally don't believe in that anymore. I think that we have not given black children, brown children, poor children enough opportunity. There's nothing wrong with their brains. They're the most brilliant human beings that I know. We just have to find ways to meet their needs and address the societal woes that they didn't ask for, that they just inherited because of our disrupt and dysfunctional society. So what does that look like as a leader? What does it look like to lead with your head and your heart? You have to be unflinching in it. You're going to be challenged. You're going to be questioned. You're going to be two of something, but you have to stand in it and you have to own it. And it can't just be in your words. The graphic that you see, we created this in you city. And these are the virtues of my leaders. I have an amazing team, could not do the work without them. And so these are the things that we aspire to be as leaders in the school district of University City. And not just at my level, the leadership trickles down to our students. And you're going to see some representation of our amazing young people, because that's what the work is about. It is about preparing a path and a way and a world for them so that they can thrive. I was at Clayton High School's um, graduation yesterday 
and I was impressed with many of the student speeches. They, they changed the structure. Um, it was at the Jumbotron out in North County, and they had 11 student speakers in lieu of having two or three. And the students spoke their truth. They shared their pain. They shared their anger and their frustration, but in a way that presented a call to action for the adult. And if you didn't hear it, oh my gosh, um, it was just powerful. But that is what leading with the head and heart is about, creating the space so that those young people can speak their truth and then have the support so that they can move forward. So in U City, we came up with our vision, which is learning reimagined. And we, we looked at what we wanted our school to be, what, what types of experiences we wanted our children to have. We talked to parents, we talked to community leaders, we talked to students, we talked to teachers, and we fundamentally understood that we were creating learning experiences and preparing children for careers and professions that simply don't exist. Who would have ever thought four months ago that we would be sitting here doing communication via Zoom as our primary mode in an educational space where we thrive on relationships? So, so much is changing around us. So we have to make sure that our learning experiences in schools reflect that. We're very intentional about well-being and joy. And these are our strategic priorities. And, and it seems a little warm and fuzzy. If people aren't well, mentally, physically, emotionally, how can we expect for them to interact and navigate and support and guide our most vulnerable? We have to be well. So this is what UCity is really about. This is the cornerstone of my leadership and what I aim to create in a space that I serve 87% of my children are African-American, 87. We're a very diverse community, but I only service 52% of school age children. 48% choose other options. And we're working to change that, not just for the students who don't choose us, but most importantly, for the students who show up in our doors, in our schoolhouse every single day. Our pillars are very intentional again, and we believe this is a foundation for equity. This is how you get to equity. If you wanna talk about doing something that's gonna help move the needle and support students who've been marginalized, disenfranchised. I've been on several Zoom calls talking about reentry, several calls talking about these plans. When you talk to some parents, I made 81 home visits at the beginning of COVID when we had our closure because we could not connect with those families. Some of them were excited to see me. Some, they did not have a good experience. They weren't excited to see me. That's a problem. And as superintendent, I have to own that. I have to understand why a mom would tell me, I don't want my child to go back to that school. They don't care about him anyway. Why a parent would say that and mean it. That's a problem. So we have intentionally develop our pill is humanize. We call it out. This is a head and heart business. If you don't love the kids that you look at every day, don't teach them because you can't do something else or go somewhere else. We have to humanize our students and understand that they are human beings. We talk a lot about the social emotional supports but not just for our students, for the adults too. Think about the teacher that you've had, the worst one and how mean they were. And then put your most vulnerable child with the most social emotional needs in that classroom. It's a recipe for disaster. So we have to look at the work that we do through a humanized lens and the heart is at the center of that. And we have to support our students and affirm them and validate them for their unique brilliance that they have. They have it. For some, we may have to work a little hard to uncover it, but they have it. So how do we find ways to bring that into the schoolhouse so that our children and our adults feel supported, personalized? I believe education should fit like a fine tailor suit. It should fit. 
and it should meet that child's needs no matter how they show up. And we know that particularly in an urban district such as U City, we have a tremendous amount of, of challenges across the spectrum. Our children come to us with a lot of different needs. And we have to create these classroom spaces that allow them to fit and have a sense of belonging where they can be a part of a school community. In some instances, the only community that they will know. That is so important. Our last pillar is problematized. And no, we didn't make the word up, it's real. It's really about making sure that our students understand the school is relevant, that it means something. Worksheets, mundane work that has no connectivity to the world, to problems, they don't work. They don't keep students engaged. They don't help to move them forward academically. They don't help them to be critical thinkers. They don't help them to understand diverse thinking and diverse opinions. They don't help them negotiate for themselves and advocate for themselves and use their voice. So all the 21st century skills that we're aiming for, that we want our students to acquire, the problematized pillar makes those things come together where their learning experiences are memorable. They're relevant and they can talk to you about them and explain what sustainability is and why they're carrying jugs of water to a park to simulate the distance that women travel in Africa to get clean water. Or they can stand up for social justice and plan protest brilliantly and beautifully to advocate against police brutality. Or research, plan, plant, and grow a garden to give food to refugee families in our community. That's the problematized pillar. Those are students who are in charge of their learning with guidance and support from the adults. And one of the ones that I'm most, most proud of is to encourage students to challenge all forms of prejudice and discrimination by reacting to having a spirit of equity and inclusiveness. Call it out, make it explicit, it should not be hidden. It should not be hidden in a plan or hidden or embedded in a document. Make it very explicit and clear for people and then back up your words. Put the action behind your words. We have a lot of people who have brilliant words on a piece of paper, wonderful statements. What are you doing? What is the evidence of those statements? And I wanna be very, very clear. New City is not where I want to be. It is not where we want it to be. Let me be very clear. This is a vision. This is hard to do. This is a vision. This is our goal. This is our aspirational goal. And if your goals and your ideas don't scare you sometimes, they're not big enough. Our problems are huge. The other slides that are articulated have been a fabric of our, of our country. That's how our country was built. A black woman is not supposed to be a superintendent. Nothing in our history represents that. But I stand on the shoulders of many who paved the way for me. And so it is a moral and ethical responsibility for us to pay it forward. I understand again the privilege that I have. That's leading with the head and the heart. It's the humility that you bring to leadership that's able to get this work done. So in five years, four to be exact, starting your five, have we accomplished all of this? Absolutely not. Are we making strides? Yes. Are we unflinching in our approach? Yes. Will we get there as long as I'm in this seat? Yes. We're going to get there because this is what the work is about. And now more than ever, my staff, my students, my parents, they are on fire. They're on fire about this work. Woo, so let me go through a little bit more. So this is the work. Adriana Albert just graduated on June 15th. She was a sophomore when this picture was taken. And this is right after the Stockley verdict. And she, along with her classmate Malik, who graduated two years ago, they planned the protest. And they planned it in the front of U City High School. And I got so many comments. And I never read the St. Louis Post Dispatch comments, but there were so many comments about me and why I would allow my students to walk out and protest. I did it and I would do it again. It was beautiful. They spoke their truth. 
they had a purpose, they had a plan, and they executed it beautifully. The, the uh, t-shirt that she's wearing, it says, you woke. And she designed that t-shirt with her classmates. The proceeds from that t-shirt went to the loot businesses that were vandalized during the Stockley protest. That's what Student Voice does, and that's what relationships and trust does. Because my students told me they were going to protest. They didn't just show up. So we had an opportunity to support them and help them make sure that they had purpose and that they were safe. If we didn't have trust and a relationship with them, we wouldn't have known. And it may not have been as successful as it was. But that's leadership. Relationships and trust matter. Social justice and student voice. Again, you city students. And the one thing about this day, this was early in the morning. They started at 7 a.m. Why did they start at 7? School starts at 7.20. They wanted to be finished before the elementary students at Jackson Park arrived at school because they didn't want to scare the younger children. When you give students voice and allow them the space, you'll be amazed at what they can do. I learned a lot from them that day. This is after um, the one year anniversary of the Parkland shooting. Um, two of our students, our seniors who graduated last year, they planned a silent protest with a pair of shoes representing all of the students who had been victims of students, the space. They had their names there. It was a very moving moment. It brought attention to a very important issue and it was done on their terms. And as the adults, we simply got out of the way. The next one, um, and I love this bell hooks quote, all of our silences in the face of racist assault are acts of complicity, all of it. So if you are a part of settings where people are talking negatively about kids, or using comments or words that are derogatory to describe children, or a part of policy and decision making that you know is just flat out wrong, even if it's your boss, because sometimes we have to have the courage, shame on you. Silence is why we're in the state that we're in. There are people who are at the table, tables that I will never be invited to, and they don't say or do anything. Very proud of this. Um, Christina Sneed is, is uh, one of our teacher leaders, an amazing human being. Um, we were fortunate to be able to partner with Nicole Hannah-Jones, and we actually had her scheduled to come here in St. Louis in, in April um, to talk about her work. Um, Christina's students worked for almost a year studying the 1619 Project. And if you don't know what I'm talking about, please go back and, and, and look this up. Um, but really a representation of excellence in the writing that the students um, did as a result of this. They created documentaries. They interviewed me. I was interviewed by several of the young people. They represented facts of our history. There's a lot of conversation about, you know, monuments and what we're doing. And I don't know if your position is your position, but we don't need a monument to remind us of our history. Trust me. I promise you we don't need that to remind us of it. We live it every day. And the, the strand that connected all of their work was this heightened focus on equity. So again, when you give students and teachers the space in the place, in school, this was in our class, it's amazing what they will do. We are very committed to trauma-informed practices at the center. We understand the trauma and the secondary trauma that many of us are experiencing as educators is real. Now more than ever, we're focused on that. I'm on the Alive and Well board, very proud of that. Along with Terry Harris, we're a part of a regional work group of educators from across the region that are having these conversations. So now more than ever, if you don't know what being trauma-informed is or understand the intersectionality of trauma and the heart and race, it is real. And it is something that we're going to have to navigate and respond to more than ever. COVID-19 is here. 
We don't know when we will be back to any type of normalcy, but one of the things that we do know, it is, it is impacting people negatively every single day. I can go home and eat. I can order out. If I don't wanna ever go to a grocery store, I can get Instacart. I had kids that could not do homework because they had to work as schnooks to take care of their family. And they were afraid to go to work because they live with grandparents. They didn't want to get them sick. That's the reality. So we have to use this opportunity to educate. And if you have felt like you could not advance something in your space, this has created the space because we need to be very much aware that we're gonna have to provide those supports to our students and to their families. This is another example of action. Um, the Alive and Well work group, we have a group of student ambassadors. And these are students from about eight different districts across the region. They came together, they know about trauma. They can tell you all about it. They can tell you how they're traumatized daily. They can tell you what they need. The main thing that they were afraid of was emotional security and safety. That's what kids say, adults. And people who say, I don't do that trauma stuff. I don't do all those relationships. We need to focus on academics. They can't focus on their academics if they're afraid. If they have no caring adult, there's an activity you can do. Put a picture of every kid up in your building and then have the staff go around and indicate if they have a relationship with that child. And then go back and look at the kids who don't have a dot or a name by them. We did that. I have an amazing high school principal, Michael Peoples. He's amazing. Broke my heart. There are kids that don't have a relationship with anybody. And they show up every single day. Your students will tell you, ask them, talk to them. Roberta Booth is with the braid. She just graduated on June 15th, senior class president. Our students lead our restorative work. They train adults. They train me. They are experiencing our product. Whatever your product is, your young people are experiencing it. And if their experience isn't one of quality and one where they feel loved and validated, we're doing something wrong. This is what actionable things look like when you talk about leading with your head and your heart. And we took our students to a session and we had about 200 people in the room and it was packed and they were in a circle. They did a restorative circle. And some of them said, I don't have a sense of belonging in my school. Some of them, they, it wasn't all warm and fuzzy. Again, because we're on a journey and we're not where we need to be. And so as the adults, when we ask them, we have to receive it. We have to receive it. We have to validate them. We don't have to judge it or question it or try to get them to change their opinion. That's their lived experience. And their lived experience matters. And we have to listen to it as raw, as painful, as hurtful as it may be, but then we do something about it. That's what leading with your head and heart looks like. In Ubuntu Circle, I am because we are we have community circles with our community where we just sit around in a circle and talk about things. We can't do that as much now, but how are you connecting with people? How are you building this sense of community where people are vulnerable and willing to bring themselves to a brave and a safe space? That is needed. And it can't just be the black people all the time, y'all. It shouldn't be. I'm very comfortable in my skin, but I'm tired of being the one, one of the onlys. And I know many of my colleagues are in spaces where they're one of the onlys. And they're having a hell of a time in that space. And honestly, I don't think I have the mouth to be in that space. I think I talk too much and I talk too loud. So see again, two something. So if you are in that space, Find people that can support you. 
find that support system. Ubuntu, I am here because we are. This is a community and we have to embrace that. Policy matters. Policy matters. The policies that I articulated on the other slides, that's how we got the system. I think someone said it last week. Was it Dr. Watson, Terry? Yes. It's, we can't disrupt this system if we don't impact policy. We could talk all day. People are doing what the system is set up to do. The system is set up to give us the exact result that we have. It is racist. It is discriminatory. At times, it's sexist. It's homophobic. All of those things, we know what they are. So what are we doing to change it? So we created the Missouri model for trauma-informed schools and gave guidance to schools on how to implement a trauma-informed approach at different levels, because we know this work is hard. I have schools that are much farther along. We have eight buildings. Some buildings are much farther along. Context matters. And you can't just pick up this guidance and say, okay, school, go do it. You have to meet people where they are, but you have to be unflinching and clear about those things where, that you're not going to negotiate. So this model is designed to disrupt some of those centuries of traumatic and racist and just wrong policy. One that's very simple. We had a policy in our district that said kids couldn't eat in the classroom. We give them food in the classroom. We have breakfast in the classroom. How silly is that? That's a simple one. We partnered with the ACLU. We were number five for disproportionate suspensions of black kids. You city, the number one offense, defiance and disrespect. What does that mean? Subjectivity, racial bias, gender bias. And we wonder why our prisons look the way that they look. It's not an accident. Our policy has created that. I go back to well-being and joy. Students who feel respected, loved, safe, challenged, healthy, cared for, empowered, and heard. For real. And not when it's convenient for the adults or when they're saying the things that the adults want to hear. This is a representation of a visual that we use to do relationship PD. And we had relationship PD for every adult in our district last year. I believe that Normandy did something similar a year ago. From the cafeteria worker to the bus driver to the superintendent, we participated. Was it perfect? No. Did it affirm what we value? Yes. Did it take a lot of time? Absolutely. Did some people think we were wasting our time? I'm sure they did. But guess what? We're going to do it again. We're going to keep talking about relationships. Our children cannot be well without systems that support relationships and value it. We have to value and, a, and support. And guess what? If you wanna have a relationship with me, you probably need to know a little bit about me. So culturally responsive is just as important. Adults, we need it too. We can't expect for our teachers to show up, our leaders to show up consistently on the front line and lead with their head and heart if they're in systems that don't value that. If they're in systems that don't care for them. If they have leaders that believe that their leadership journey or their job is to make teachers' lives miserable. If they have zero accountability for themselves. If they just talk the talk but don't walk it. Our leaders, our systems need to support teachers in meaningful and authentic ways so that they too can be well. Our babies are just as important. We love yoga in you city. Shout out to the collective STL. We embrace mindfulness and taking time to be still. We're so busy and we have to find that time to be still and focus and give kids those strategies that can help them regulate, de-escalate, problem solve, understand how their brain is working and what's happening 
It's like you take a can of soda and you shake it up and just keep shaking it for like 15 minutes and then hand it to somebody and see what happens. That's how some of our kids, that's how their brain is. So when they come to school, they have no issue with you. It's all of that stuff they brought with them. And when you tap them on their shoulder, the touch is just like, uh. And then they assault to you that we have to understand all of those pieces of the relationship so that people have the tools to see that when I come in and I, I my brain is like this, they give me the space to calm down and don't get in my face or point a finger or raise your voice or use negative terms. And when I give it right back to you, there's a problem. Those are the tools and the understanding. And oh yes, our support staff are just as important. We need counselors, we need social workers. Yes, we do. We need you all to be there as well to support the work and we need more of them. That's a policy thing. Our standards for how we fund counselors and social workers, it, it's embarrassing. But we spend billions of dollars on a criminal justice system. But we can't find the money to have a social worker for every building. We know what happens when kids are not well. We can predict it. So that's a system thing that we have to change. We have to force people to understand the money's in the wrong place. That system is doing what we designed it to do. And if that's what we want as a country, that's scary. But I believe those young people I heard last night at Clayton, they're, they're about to shake some things up. I'm so excited about our young people and I hope we have some on the phone today. Okay, so well-being is I'm almost finished and I can answer questions. We created the Peace Place on our website for teacher appreciation. It was one of the things that we did to celebrate our teachers that week. And it's also for our parents. And it's a website, we didn't create it. We, we stole it from another district. So we love to borrow things, borrow things. That's what we need to be doing. Everybody works in their silo. The work is too hard and it's too big for me to do it by myself here in U City. I have to partner with my brother in Rockwood. You know, I have to talk to other superintendents. And uh, Joe Davis is on the call. I have to check in with people. My good friend is in Columbia, Peter Stiefelman. I have to check in with those people so that we can bring the work together. But the Peace Place is a website that just has mindful moments. It has other tools and resources for the psychological support and well-being support of young people. We need that. Our teachers need it and our parents need it. So after... George Floyd um, was killed, murdered. Um, my heart hurt. Um, it hurt a lot. I said, I have, a, I have two children. I have a son. So I raised a black boy, black man. And my, my heart hurts. It's very heavy. And so I said something. But what I was saying, it was kind of like deja vu. We've been here before. And so I just wanna keep calling those things out. And I just have a few tidbits of what I share with my community. And I did this on my own. And I think we have to sometimes get out in front. Sometimes we wait for people. If you have a call to action or something that you feel needs to change, stand, find you some support. But I shared the, emo the emotions because they were real and intense and a part of my humanity as a black woman and as a mother and a part of my body's natural response to trauma and pain. I'm human first, y'all. I'm Sharonica first. Superintendent is what I do. That's not who I am. And you have to be who you are in this work. You can't change like a chameleon. You have to be consistent because that matters too. When you start changing and flipping and flopping based on who's in the room, that's called being fake. And we have a lot of fake people in our space. And we have to be real because our problems are so very real. So these are just some parting words um, that I'll leave with you. And then I'll be happy to see if there are any questions or any comments.
Leaders must possess the valor to address unspoken truths. There isn't a playbook for this. There isn't a handbook, but we see it every day. I don't need a handbook. I don't need a document. I don't need resolutions to tell me that equity is a challenge, that bigotry is real, that people don't value me just because of the way that I look, that people don't value my children just simply because of the way they look. I don't, need, I don't need a lot to affirm that. I live it every day. You live it every day. This is the only way we can promote meaningful opportunities for our children. And sometimes things are not as overt as the killing of an unarmed Black man. There are subtle things that happen. IEP meetings. Student support team meetings. Discipline hearings classrooms from pre-k through grade 12 on the playground in the cafeteria there are things that happen in our schools that aren't as overt but that we we don't challenge them we're silent we have to have a politically a politically correct statement we have to take our time to respond we have to make sure that it's right, that it's processed. It wasn't right when that child experienced it. I remember vividly one of my sixth grade teachers, Mr. Warren, I won't say the district. He looked at me one day, I was talking with my friend, but they all talk. And my mama told me don't go to school and talk because I better not get in trouble. And I rode a bus to my school 45 minutes one way. And I was sitting in my class, 11 years old. And I started talking too. And he looked at me and he was at his desk because he never got up. He was at his desk and he said, you are so ugly. Everyone heard him. I acted as if I didn't. And then he said it again. He said, you are so ugly. And then as an adult, he said, and when you go home to tell your mom, tell your mom, I said, you're acting ugly. Well, the week before, I told my mom that he said I looked like a slave when he was describing a text we were reading. That's what the subtle things that adults can do. And years later, I vividly remember his words. What are the words and the actions that your students remember? What are the words and the actions that you've seen displayed toward children where you said nothing? Every experience matters. Every interaction matters. You can't discount it. What you may think is not a big deal, you never know how that child will carry it and how it will impact them. And that's why we must lead with our head and our heart. We don't have room for anything else. And honestly, sometimes when my head is a little crazy, I'm, I'm just going to go with my heart. Because when I go with my heart, I know deep down I'm not going to hurt a child. So that's who I am, that's my journey, that's the work that we are engaged in with many, many, many partners that I could not name today. And I just thank um, Dr. Harris for giving me the opportunity to share just a little bit about UC. Cool, thank you. Let's uh, give Sharonica a virtual round of applause in the chat box. Um, and then let's just take a deep breath. Let's just take a deep breath because you, know, you said a lot um, your title of your presentation was exactly what you have been feeling. Um, I think, you know, you guys need to know that obviously I talked to all the presenters before, um, and we get on the call before the call. And, um, you know, I think that Sharonica was, we were talking about the emotion, emotional part of this presentation and how, you know, this presentation is pretty emotional. And I think part of that emotion, and I don't want to speak for you, um, but part of the emotion is the fact that you're celebrating your 25th year in, in education. And so, um, you know, you're probably more so on, you know, the way out of education than actually starting. And the emotion of where you were 25 years ago, and not necessarily you as a person, but really the system and where we are now. And that's the heavy part, right? Especially when people are doing um, things like this. So. Um, listen, they are saying a lot, 
we have like five minutes, so I don't know if anyone would like to, and you said a lot. Um, so I think that part of what people are gonna have to do is just really pause, reflect, and breathe, and take in what you said. But if there's a question that someone wants to pop in or ask uh, before I let you go, um, you know what, no, we're not gonna do questions. We're not gonna do that. We're going to just take this five minutes that we have before we get off this call. And I want you guys to um, take a picture of this, this uh, Sharonica's email. And here's my ask for today, right? Two things, one, all 400, 350 of us on this, this call, let's, let's absolutely flood her email with either congratulations on your 25th year or thank you for your words or I'm here with you, whatever you want to do. And I think it's important because I think that um, as you guys witnessed today, all the things that Sharonica talked about and um, just the emotional toll that it takes on people who are truly saying something and out there being true and not playing the political games, right? And I think that, you know, we have to remember that there are a lot of leaders who are very complicit in this mess and this nastiness. And then there are individuals who are saying, I'm not doing that anymore. If we're gonna change the system, then we have to change the system for all people. And we also have to acknowledge the fact that there are people who are working really hard every single day to change the system. And sometimes they just need an email or sometimes they need a shout out on Twitter that says, I see you, I appreciate you, and I value you. So take a picture, either you know, send her an a, a email or send her a message on Twitter, but let's make sure, and not, you know, today we're focusing on Sharonica, right? Uh, and, and maybe tomorrow we can talk about someone else, but let's just say thank you to those individuals who are working really hard to make a difference for our people. Um, real leadership is the ability to be vulnerable, to love, and to be real. And Sharonica, you're all those things. And so for the last 25 years, all the students and teachers and whoever, parents that um, crossed your path, I'm sure they felt that. So I hope so. Take yeah. a bow. We love you. <laughs> love we you too. You. Thank you. And, uh, we're on this journey with you together. Ubuntu. What's up, my U City family? What time is it? <laughs> right. And I forgot to say this, but um, look at all these U time. Um, so if you, if you, you know, let's keep this hashtag going for the rest of the week, you know, uh, really focusing on Sharonica. I post tomorrow who's coming up next, but today is about Sharonica. This week is about Sharonica and her message. So whatever things that you heard that really sticks with you or have you reflecting, let's continue this conversation on Twitter. Use a hashtag, say something. Make sure you tag myself. Make sure you tag Sharonica. Uh, I didn't say this earlier, but I'm Terry Harris. I'm the Executive Director of Student Services for the Rockwood School District. And I uh, just want to shout out to uh, my superintendent, Dr. Miles, who, um, uh, you know, is, is definitely in line with this Say Something movement and giving me the space and platform to really show up and be me. Um, even probably when we don't agree on it, all things, I don't think that we've had a disagreement ever. Um, but, you know, I think that it's, it's important to make sure that we say thank you to those individuals who, um, you know, give people an opportunity. So. It's really hard. Sharonica, thank you so much. We'll thank you. Thanks, everyone.